climb a tree. Watch out. Ah! Welcome to another episode of The Forbidden Limb. We're doing something a little different this time. Uh, I'm acting as the host. I'm Jerry Commander. Uh, normally, Richard New is our intrepid host and asks fantastic questions. Uh, but because we're talking about Puerto Spiel San Jose, and this is part two of our conversation, I'll be acting as the host because I was the host of that event. And with us is Brian Hank of Overworld Games. And let's dive right into it of some things we can hopefully learn from Puerto Spiel San Jose to improve our own business of board games. What would you guys like to see done differently at the next event? Hmm. I wish I had more time on the, the game design contest. But, you know, having a limited was, uh, you know... Should, so the game design contest, we held it on Sunday. You get a, a, a box of bits mm -hmm. that is sealed up. You don't know what's in it. And you open their box of bits. And your team, it could be two guys, could be five guys. You have one hour to build the game. And then you have three minutes to pitch it to the panel of judges. And then the judges award, like, a first place and a second place for best, coolest game designs. I also stole this from Port of Houston. I thought it was brilliant. I did it. It was super fun. The game I made in my first game design contest, I actually said, this is a pretty good game. We, we played it afterwards. Like, this is good. We're going to develop it and make it a real game. And it turned into something. In fact, a lot of the games that came out of the game design contest turn into real games. We kept ours. We're going to do it. We can do it with ours, yeah. That's, that's fantastic. So more time for the game design contest. Yeah. What else? Well, I had, you know, what, honestly, like, putting a limit on the time... You know, forcing limits makes you make choices and makes you do different things. So if you had, like, two hours to do it, like, that would just... It just means... For us, we were discussing it for about 40 minutes. <laughs> and then we had 20 minutes to quickly... Okay, 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 what we just discussed, put that on the... I got, no, 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 I got that part, you know. And you're quickly rushing around trying to get all the little pieces together. And you, okay, okay, we'll do that, we'll do that, we'll get, okay. And then we, we pitch it like this, we say this, we, you know. Like, you're just rushing by the end to try and get, you know everything done, if you made it a two-hour limit, I bet you would be talking for an hour and 40 minutes. <laughs> and you still have 20 minutes to write, you know, because you just, there, you got four desperate, mi desperate minds there, yeah, and they're yeah, all yeah. just um, uh, talking about what they would prefer and what they would like. You know, you have to find some compromise and find some way to make it work out and make everybody agree, oh, I like that, yeah, that's, let's do that. I, I was amazed by, you know, how, how many really awesome looking games were created in the event. And, and, and they all had the same stuff, right? Yeah. Same yeah, components in every box. Right? Yeah, yeah, same yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it was, some really creative stuff. Some people um, you just kind of did like more of a boring game that was that like worked. You know, like they made sure that it was like they did play testing and they made sure it worked. <laughs> and some people went more for just like making it look really cool. You know, yeah. like uh, in, in like they just focused on Explaining how cool this game could be if you actually did have a lot of time to, to play test it and make it perfect. Right. But it was still, wow. I have to say that uh, Brian was on the panel of judges that judged the, uh, the game contest, so thank you. Yep. And uh, Teal Fristo organized it. He ordered the kits and he ran the contest for me, uh, which was fantastic. He volunteered to do that after last year. It took a tremendous burden off me. And thanks, thanks very much to Teal for, for taking that on. It's a lot of work. The design contest, you asked me earlier what we do to bring people in. And this is one of the things. A lot of the designers and the players look forward to that as a highlight of the event because yeah. it is a, a blast mm -hmm. doing that and seeing all the wacky games people come up with. And I think it's also very useful for a designer. Uh, as uh, So Kevin Nunn, my Portugal mentor, says, he goes, and I realize a lot of designers are good at designing games, but they're not so good at pitching it. Mm -hmm. When they have that opportunity to reach the publisher or to do publisher speed dating, and so the design contest forces you to practice pitching because you've got three minutes to pitch this game. And it's one you made in an hour, so you're not hopefully too emotionally attached to it. Right. So it's a good exercise <laughs> to say, oh, I gotta go. How do I pour my heart in this And some people were really good at it, though, too, like Chris Costagnetto, too, are, you know. He's the piss yeah, 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 he's really good. He was, yeah, he was right on with that pitch. And, and that makes a big difference if you decide not to self publish. Being able to pitch to a publisher and give the ele elevator pitch in like two minutes. Mm -hmm. Here are my components, here's my mechanics, here's my theme, here's what makes my game cool or different. And if you can lay that out, that's a, that's a significant skill to have. Brian, what would you like to see different in the future? Food, you mentioned, was a big part of the of the budget, and it yeah. wasn't important to me. It actually wasn't something that, that mattered. I, I didn't even, I, I barely had time to even, you know, get it. it, it grab a piece of pizza, you know, so, um, 
don't know. Maybe it's just me because I when I get when I go to a convention or something, like I don't even get hungry. Like I just go. I play yeah. the whole time. I don't even think about food. So I'm just the old days at Gen Con and I then at that, get home that night and realize I haven't eaten anything yeah. all day long. All day. Yeah. So that wasn't that important to me. So if it takes a big part of the budget, then maybe it'd be something to cut, or maybe we could do you know like a. Uh, have 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 an order in type of thing where like mm-hmm. if you could if you could work with maybe a couple companies who um, will you just order what you want then they'll bring it to you then it keeps them there too and, and maybe it wouldn't have to come out of your budget they just kind of manage that individual order I don't know if, if any would be able to do that and handle enough all the people and but uh, maybe something to consider so that might be um, I would say just removing that but I do I see what you're saying about how it, it might make people leave you know. And if, I, if there were no food options, maybe, you know, someone would be like, hey, let's go to the restaurant down the street. And then I'd be like, okay, I'll come with you. And then, might, like, yeah, everybody leaves. It might be interesting to have a, a venue, like, right next to where a bunch of food trucks go. You or, know? yeah, then, so food trucks Then you come. go out, you grab your food. I don't know how easy it would be to make, get the yeah, food trucks yeah. to come to you. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I mean, I think they have sort of set locations that they go to. But if you, if you had a location where it's like the food trucks are... Uh, on on Fridays and Saturdays are always there, you know. Then people go out, grab their food, come back in, and they're they're back to playing games. And that's sort of I mean, the, That'd be cool. one of the big things is you know they could eat, they could, and then it takes off you, the budget off of you. So so if there are any anyone out any viewers out there who want to do something like this, can you just start your own farmers field? Can you just start your own? Sure, own? sure. So it's easier to do that with Unpub than it is to do it with Protospiel. Unpub has a guide on their website. Here's how to organize uh, a, a, an event. You can submit it to their event system and they list it on their website. Uh, and designers can put their games in the, da- the database and gather feedback through the database, through the Unpub app, through the feedback form, and they're there to support you through the whole process. So it means you probably need to do it on a, a small scale. Like, hey, hey, game store, can we use your 10 tables for this Saturday afternoon and do an Unpub mini? Uh, and so you can Apply online to put your uh, your event in with Unpub. Find a venue that will they'll host you and do that, and then get the word out and get some designers to show up. And hopefully, the game store will help you bring some players in. And see, I highly recommend that everyone do this. If there's not an Unpub mini in your city, you should do one. You should make one, and especially at a small scale. It's very easy to do. Like, oh, we're going to do five designers or ten designers in this game store. You can you can pull that off without going crazy. Uh, for Protospiel, you contact them through their website. And they want to see, you know, like a, a, a larger event held annually in like a certain city. Uh, and then, then you get listed on the main Protospiel website and they, an organizer, hopefully an organizer that they, they know or they trust that's going to be running that event each year. And so their process is less formal. Uh, Dave, uh, uh, I'm going to pronounce the name wrong, Dave Witcher is the guy who started the first Protospiel. Because someone's like, oh, I wish we had something like that in the U.S. And so he's like, oh, I'm going to do it. And he's been doing it up in Michigan for a long time. That's the big one in terms of designers. They get like 100 designers to go, and lots of publishers go to the event. It's a, a high-level event. Uh, and everybody else, including me, is a spin-off of that. I went to that event because Matthew told me I should go, and it was an eye-opening experience for me. And like, ah, oh, I want to see if I can run one of these on, on the West Coast. So by all means, you, you can do it. You can do your own pro school event. You can do your own Unpub event. Uh, I highly recommend organizing one for your city. You will learn so much from your fellow designers, and you will help each other level up your games and create a network where you support each other. So when you do go to Kickstarter, you can say, hey guys, I'm launching my game. Can you help get the word out, or can you back me? And having, like, like I, I like to be able to endorse another designer's work that I played and I thought was good. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, be careful how you ask this, because some people may not like your game or your style of game. But say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm launching it here. What can you do for me? And if I really like it, you know, I'm going to tweet about it. I'm going to back it. I'm going to tell Richard to back it. I'm going to tell Brian to back it. Uh, if I was like, oh, that was an okay game, you know, I may back it for five bucks or mention it or something like that. But that helps build your chances of success. Or the other thing you gain is uh, introductions. Publishers value a lot more when a designer they already know comes to them and say, hey, you need to play Richard's game. I played this game. This is a great game. It's a good fit for your publishing company. And that kind of third-party endorsement gives the publisher a lot more confidence. So like, oh, yeah, I should check this game out. And you can build that network through doing an Unpub or Portis Bill event. And publishers and designers, there, they can go there to make those connections, to do this amazing playtesting with, you know, just, you know, with other designers that will give them really good feedback. And then, you know, just a, a ton of people, you know, a whole bunch of 
playtest in, so designers and publishers could could help somebody create this too. You know, like you, I think you did a lot of it on your own. You had, you had help from some people, but it was mostly you. But you know, they could come together with just you know some fellow designers and publishers in their area if they know of any. If you're going to do a small scale, like ten designers, you can do that without out being too hard on you. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah up in Sacramento has yeah. done it a couple times, and I've, I've been to some other smaller events that too. That, and that, that's very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, how many pure uh, uh, publishers showed up at uh, this year? Oh, that's a great question. It, it depends on the event. So last year, we had, I think, four publishers show up. Five publishers. I've looked at my, my notes. This year we had one, two, three, just, just I think Brian, uh, Blue Panther, Vezier were the only publishers that came up. I, I want to say good expectations. So publishers do go to Protospiel and Unpub events, and they often do sign games there. That does happen. Whereas there was several publishers at Unpub 5, there was two or three at Protospiel Houston, there was several at Steve Jackson Game went to Protospiel Austin, and the, the big one up in Michigan, there's a bunch of publishers there. But as a designer, I say it's more valuable for you to go to Portispiel to level up your game, to test your game. Is it ready? Can I make it better? What do other designers think of it? How do I fix this problem that keeps coming up? Use that as like your level two playtest and to build your social network. Not like, oh, I'm going to go there and get my game signed. Because yeah. mm -hmm. I think that's a bad expectation. Mm -hmm. And, and Unblub says this too. They, want, they want, don't want to set that expectation that, hey, you're going there to get signed. I think the better venue for doing that is conventions and talking to publishers at a convention, at a speed date, or solicitations via email, can I send you my rules, if you like it, I'll send you a prototype. That's the way to get to the publisher. Use the event to test your game and make it better, and, and other designers' games, and to build your network. You sort of, you agree with that as a publisher? I mean, yeah. Um, I, I think... Because uh, you, you were asked a lot. Yeah, I was asked said. a lot to play test games, and I wasn't specifically looking for a game to publish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I made a lot of great connections with designers and, and played some great games, but for me, I think it was more about building that that relationship with other designers that, you know, I, I want to see what they're going to do in the future, and then maybe we could work together in the future. If I would have found a game that I thought was a perfect fit, it was a really fun game, you know, I, I would have approached them about signing the game. But... Uh, I mean, we have a lot of games that are, we're working on right now in, in developing and um, getting ready to, to get out there. So, you know, we don't really, we're not, we're not like, just desperate to find games right now. But, so, so, yeah, but I mean, you can always make, you know, good connections with people, and these things last. And, you know, so, you know, they'll be, when we are looking for a game, I, I know some people to, to be on the lookout for. Okay. The uh, League of Game Makers was there and supported the mm -hmm. event, and we talked about, should we do an award for the event? and say, like, you know, best Euro game or best social game, and like, how these rewards, like film festivals do. We have all the little palms for the festivals who've won something and are accepted. And we had a discussion about this, and we were worried it would ruin the dynamic of the event, that it would be competitive mm -hmm. instead of cooperative. Instead of, you know, designers helping other designers. Be like, oh, I'm competing to win this mm -hmm. award. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell him how he can fix his game. Exactly. It would ruin the environment. So we opted not to do that for that reason. And I worry about the publisher thing, too. So if I'm just focused on, oh, my gosh, I'm going to get a publisher, then mm -hmm. I'm going to miss that opportunity to make my game better, to make other games better, or to make connections with people. Uh, and so, like, at Unpub 5, I met Daniel Solis in person. I played his prototype game, A La Carte, that I loved as a TCG player. I'm like, this game is great. I gave him some hopefully useful advice on how to improve it, coming from that TCG background, which he implemented in the game. And then I signed it to be a remote playtester for that. And he sent me a copy that I tested locally, but he was not even in the room, and we recorded audio feedback and sent it for him, and so, so we get new people to play that game through that connection that he made at, at Unbun 5. Yeah, but a lot of it is just a local place where designers, publishers, gamers go to just, you know, meet others that are like them. Maybe they're going to spin off and do their own, um, a, maybe a, a prototype event, but maybe just, you know, a game night. You know, yep. Like, Here, I know you, now, you know, that we, we live close together, and, you know, let's get together. I go to this game night. I go to this one, like, oh, okay, I'll try that one. And so just, you know, a lot of it is just that network building. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, you've been watching another episode of The Forbidden Limb. Thank you for tuning in. To find more of our episodes, you can go to theforbiddenlimb.com or find us on the Dice Tower Network. You can also go to boardgamegeek.com and look for our guild. We would like to hear from you. Please leave us, leave us a comment. Shoot us an email about what topics you want to see in the future because we will roll those into future episodes. Until then, Richard will see you across the table in the future.
Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.